but uh, glad that it's working now. Cool. Yeah, sure. So a question, uh, just a quick question here that came up. One of the questions early on was, are you going to give us tips and tricks on how to uh, per, uh, to pass the certification, uh, to pass the CSWP? So um, it's a great question. And although I'm not going to get, it's not really like the topic of today, just to kind of give you a quick tip as to how how I approach it, you know, the, one of the cool things that I like to do to help me with the CSWP is when you're creating these dimensions for CSWP, you're going to be asked to change the dimensions. So, for example, you might have question one that looks something like this. And then uh, in question two, they might say change dimension A and change dimension B. So there's two things that I like to do that kind of help with that. So the first thing that I like to do here is um, I'll go in and I'll change this dimension by labeling it. So I'll call this dimension like labeled dimension A here. So I'm actually double clicking on the dimension, looking at the dimension properties here, and then I'm changing the value here to letter A. And then I'll also do the same thing here. I'll double click on this dimension, change it to letter B. So that's our dimensions A and B. And then what I'll also often do is I'll go to the dimension text and kind of do the same thing. So underneath the dimension here, uh, after I cl single click on the dimension, I'll come over here and I'll change this to A and I'll change this to B. Sometimes I'll even go in and adjust the font on those dimensions. So I'll, I'll, for example, go to this dimension here, go to other, go to font and make the font larger on that dimension. What this does is it just makes it a little easier for me to see. And by the way, those of you that are just jumping in, we're not getting started yet. This is just a little pregame warm up, talking a little bit about CSWP strategies. So if you're getting ready to take the exam, this is something that could uh, maybe help you with the exam. So, and then the final thing that I'll do here is I'll right mouse button on this dimension and I'll say link value and I'll call it something like a dim and I'll right mouse button on this dimension here and I'll go link value and I'll call this something like B dim. And so what that does for me is when I go from question to question, I can easily see these values, but it also creates the equation folder here. And then you can see in the equation folder, a real quick list of all of those dimensional values. So that, um, you know, when you're when you're working through the CSWP, when you're working through the exam, you know, you can kind of keep track of those dimensional values. And when you go from one question to the next, it just gives you like a nice contained area where you can quickly go back and look over the values from those dimensions. So um, I'm just going to take a look here. We're going to take a look at some of the questions that are coming in from chat. Looks like we got about 50 people in the, in the uh, live stream here. So thank you all so much. I'm not going to be able to, to keep an eye on these questions the whole time. It's going to get a little bit overwhelming, but I hope you guys like that. It's just a little quick tip getting started beforehand. Uh, that's something that I like to do when I'm doing the exams, because a lot of times those exams will have a question that goes, you know, uh, here's question one, here's the dimensional values, A, B, C, D, and then here's question two. And you know, it'll, it'll change those dimensional values and you'll have to go in and change them. So it's good to kind of have a running list of those values. Okay, so we're just about at one o'clock, not quite there yet, um, but we're getting pretty close. So we are going to get started here in just a moment. Appreciate the, uh, the shout out there, Trader Parker. Uh, nice to see you in here. Brian's here as well. What's up, Brian? Uh, looks like Mike, Mike Spence is here as well. What's up, Mike? All right, I hope everything's coming through. If there's any problems with the audio or the video, let me know. Um, I am going to get started here in just a moment. We are going to be modeling some coffee. So this is the coffee that I'm going to be drinking today while we're, while we're modeling up this coffee cup. So let me just pour that into my coffee mug here. All right. So cheers, everyone. Everyone who's, who's uh, tuning in, welcome to the live stream. I am gonna need your help today on this presentation. So quick question for the chat. What unit system do you wanna use? So if you're in the chat, uh, you know, let me let me know. Oh, what's up Nuno? Welcome, welcome. Thanks for tuning in. Great to see you in here. Um, always get some great questions from Nuno, so appreciate seeing you in here. Uh, let me know in the chat if you guys wanna see me model this thing in millimeters or in inches. You can just type it in there. All right, Andrew's going to refill his coffee as well. So cheers, Andrew. Cheers to everybody who's who's uh, tuning in, everybody who uh, wants to drink coffee along with me. Another question came in from the chat. Um, 
do are we going to be following along or are we going to be flying through this so it's a great question the answer is we're going to be uh going at a, a relatively quick pace but you're welcome to follow along with um and i'll talk to you a little bit more about that in just a moment Looks like we're getting a lot of feedback from the chat. Everybody's saying metric, metric, metric. All right, I think we got a clear winner here in the chat, so appreciate that. That means everybody can hear me as well. So um, one last thing I'm going to do just before we get started is, you know, we're going to be modeling this um, coffee mug here, this beautiful coffee mug. And as we're modeling this coffee mug, we've got this handle here. And whenever I've got kind of swoopy geometry like that or tricky geometry like that, I like to utilize photos in the SolidWorks workflow to help with that process. So I'm just going to take a, a quick photo of this, uh, of this coffee mug here. And so what I'm going to do... What I'm going to do here is I'm going to put this on my desk now. Just a couple of little tricks when you're taking a photo. You know, if you're taking a photo of the handle of the mug, you want the background to be pretty much blacked out, but you also want to be perpendicular to the photo. So I found this dry erase marker. I'm just going to put that down there, and then I'm going to put the, uh, the mug on there so I can get a good photo of that. And then I'm just going to grab my phone here, and I'm going to take a picture of that mug. So I'm just going to... Whoop, Darth Vader just fell over. Okay, buddy, you're going to have to sit down here. So I'm going to take a picture of that mug, and when I take a picture of that mug, I'm going to, I don't want to be too close. I don't want to be way down here, okay? I'm going to end up with a lot of perspective and a lot of problems. So you want to be a little bit further out. Also, a lot of times your cell phone will have kind of like a grid system on the cell phone. So you can use that to help, uh, to help organize your pictures as well, and that'll, that'll help, you know, with the process. So here you can see the photo that I took of that mug. Uh, I'm just going to, like throw that photo onto my computer. We're gonna use that a little bit later in the presentation, uh, but I did wanna get that started while I had that question out there for everybody. Should we use millimeters or inches? So it looks like a lot of people are saying use millimeters. I hope that helps a little bit when it comes to taking photos, just a, you know, a couple of quick best practices there, which is uh, you wanna make sure that you're not gonna to get too much perspective from that photo. And one way that you can do that is by kind of uh, standing back a little bit from your target. Okay, that does bring us up to one o'clock, so we are officially gonna get started now. So welcome everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we have a clear winner here for millimeters for the design today. Um, so I'm gonna take that question down and I wanna say welcome to the live stream, welcome to SolidWorks Live Design. So a lot of people you know, are finding themselves in kind of an unusual spot. Uh, they're maybe working from home for the first time. Maybe they're finding that they are dusting off an old copy of SolidWorks, or maybe they're finding themselves with a little more time on their hands, and so they are uh, trying to brush up on their SolidWorks skills, get better with the software while there's maybe a slower period of work. And we wanted to do whatever we could. You know, the team here at Dasso, the SolidWorks team, wanted to do whatever we could to help facilitate that learning process. So the team came up with a great idea. Let's just start doing some kind of almost like lunch and learn, live stream type of things. We can answer questions from the chat live. You can follow along with during this presentation. I'm going to be designing this coffee mug here. So you can follow along with during the presentation. I'm going to be going at kind of a, a fast pace, but not so fast that you can't follow along with. But the one piece of advice I would give you is uh, if you don't get the dimensions exactly what I've got, it's okay. Just Get, get them close, right? And, and as long as you're pretty close, if you, like if I went through a dimension and you missed it, don't feel like you have to, you know, you have to call me out and ask me for what that dimension is. Just type in something that you think looks good. So we're gonna go through, we're gonna design this over lunch. Hopefully you're able to click along with, and even if you're not clicking along with, I'm pretty confident you're gonna get a lot of good tips and tricks. The scenario here is that I've got this coffee mug and it doesn't fit in my car, all right? I wanna go out and drive around. Uh, wouldn't that be nice to be able to go out and drive around right now? Uh, I want to go out and go and uh, drive around, but I, this doesn't fit into my car uh, because of the cup holders in my car. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to design a, a coupling, a 3D printed coupling that goes between my existing uh, cup holder in my car uh, to this, to this coffee mug, so that I can take a coffee mug out there because right now it doesn't work. There's no room for the handle, basically. This is something that I do all the time, uh, not with this specific application, but with many, many other applications. I'm constantly taking things around the house uh, that I need to fit something onto, I need to build a cover for, I need to build a new latch for, a new bracket, something to hold it. And I will draw it up in SolidWorks and then 3D print that device to go around what I've drawn up. 
So this is something that although we're doing it with a coffee mug, you can imagine these skills could be applicable to a number of different scenarios. So when it comes to looking at a model like this, what we need to do is we need to decide kind of what we're going to be modeling and how we're going to be modeling. What features are we going to be using? So for a cup like this, it's, you know, it's probably going to be a revolve. Now it could be a boss extrusion as well. You could do a boss extrusion and then do some cuts, but I think I would probably do this as a revolve. A lot of times I'll break up my features into multiple features, but in this scenario, I'm probably going to do most of it just as one single sketch and then revolve it. So that's going to be the main shape is going to be revolved. Then the handle, I'm either going to do a sweep or a loft. Um, we use a number of things to determine that, but in a situation like this, it could probably be either because you could use a sweep and use guide curves to have it more thick and then get more narrow and then get more thick again. Or you could use a loft and do the same thing, have a, a wider profile, a thinner profile, wider profile. When you learn a lot about the Pierce command and you learn a lot about guide curves, you learn that a lot of times you can interchange a sweep and a loft. You could use either. Uh, so for today, I'm going to do it as a loft, but it could go either way. We're going to talk about using uh, fillets. Uh, we're going to talk about some different types of fillets that we can create. And um, we're going to also talk a little bit about using a sketch picture, bringing a picture in and using that picture to help determine what this geometry for the handle should be. So if you're taking notes, this is kind of what my notes would look like, I think. We're going to talk a little bit about revolves and double dimensions. We're going to talk about using sketch picture. We're going to talk about using splines and ellipses. And we're going to talk about using fillets. So if you want to look for some kind of key topics that we're going to be going through during today's presentation, those would be the ones that I would look for. I'm going to take a quick look at the chat here. Uh, just see if anybody has any major questions. I think we're pretty good, though, for questions here. Yep. All right. Awesome. Uh, we got some a tip here from Mike Sandy about avoiding perspective if you're using uh, DSLR. Uh, I'm not using that, Mike, uh, but I appreciate the tip. I will remember that. Okay. All right. Looks like we're pretty good. Is that beer cans behind me? No, those are not beer cans. Those are coffee cans. Uh, that's how I stay sharp and fast when I'm doing designs like this. You can never have enough of those coffee cans, especially when the world is in lockdown. That's the one thing I don't miss. If you guys ever watch that show, The Expanse, shout out to The Expanse. Uh, that's the one lesson I learned from that show is that you never want to be without coffee. All right. Awesome questions. Uh, appreciate the feedback here. Let's get into it with this model. So when it comes to uh, this model here, like I said, I'm going to start out by making a new part and the chat has spoken and we are going to be working in millimeters. So I'm going to make this new part in millimeters here and I'm going to now need to create the revolve for this part. So I've got a dial caliper here. We're going to go through, we're going to do this thing live. So we're going to create the geometry for the revolve for this part. Now, one thing I want to mention just real quick here before I get started when it comes to double dimensions and the revolve command, uh, really two things I want to mention here. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the ability to create double dimensions and have them automatically translate to a diameter is based on what you select when you're creating the dimension and what you select when you're creating the revolve. And I'll show you what I mean here. I'm going to create a double dimension that goes from this line over to this center line here. And then I'm going to move across the center line. That's how you create what's called a double dimension. So again, I'm just creating a uh, dimension here from this line to the center line crossing over. All right, we'll make that 100 millimeters. Now I'm going to choose features revolve and I'm going to choose this center line to revolve about. And you'll see that what SolidWorks does is it automatically takes this 100 dimension and it turns it into a diameter dimension here. You can see it added the diameter dimension onto that 100 dimension. Now, the reason that that happened is because I selected the same center line for the dimension that I selected for the revolve command. So let me show you what I mean by that. If I was to edit this sketch and create a second center line up top here, and now I go into my revolve command and I say edit feature and I want to revolve about this line here and hit the green check mark. You can see that now it's no longer displaying as a diameter. It's still a double dimension, but it's no longer displaying as diameter. It's also no longer hooked to the circular edge. It's now a double dimension. This is something you might do if you were going to model half of the model and then mirror it on one of the final steps. You would you could model using double dimensions for that purpose. Or if I was to create the revolve, and this is the one that happens more commonly, and revolve about this line. 
instead. So maybe you've got several center lines and SolidWorks doesn't choose the appropriate center line. Um, and so you just choose on your, on your own. You, you pick yourself. So you pick a solid line. Same thing's going to happen. You're not going to get that diameter symbol automatically. So that's a pretty common question that I hear, especially when people are just getting started with SolidWorks. You know, I made the double dimension. How come it doesn't change to diameter? Or how do I get those diameter symbols to add in automatically? And the answer to that question is when you do your revolve, pick the same center line that you created the double dimensions about. Another spot that I've heard uh, more than once is how come only some of my dimensions are getting the doubled uh, or the diameter symbol? How come only it's only working with some of my dimensions? Well, in a scenario like this, maybe you created a second center line because you, you thought like, okay, this will be good. I'll have this dimension coming off the top. But now you're not revolving about that same center line. So in this scenario, you can see that the lower one got the diameter symbol and is going to the circular edge, and the upper one is just acting like a double dimension. So when it comes to double dimensions, you know, that's one thing you want to remember. The other thing you want to remember that's pretty cool about double dimensions is that when you uh, get started and you create your first double dimension, SolidWorks remembers the axis that you selected. So if, for example, I pick here, cross over, and now I get that double dimension, you'll notice that my cursor looks a little different. Um, let me just confirm that my cursor is showing up here, but you'll notice that my cursor looks a little bit different. And what that's telling me is that when I, uh, uh, when I have that symbol on the cursor, yeah, I'm, I'm just viewing my screen real quick just to see if the cursor feedback's coming through properly. I think it is. My preview showed me that it is, so. Cool. All right, so, my, so when your cursor looks like this, when your cursor looks like the uh, arrow, the dimension symbol, a letter D and the center line. What that means is that you're in this special mode where now you can pick additional lines that are parallel to your center line. And when you pick those additional lines, you can see that the double dimension is already kind of preloaded and ready to go. So that's just a little bit of a, a quick tip, uh, maybe a little bit of functionality you didn't know about. Um, so when we're creating our mug here, you can see that we're gonna go front plane, begin a sketch, orient the view front plane, begin a sketch, orient the view. We're gonna start out by creating a center line and then we're gonna create the basic shape of the mug and that basic shape is gonna look something like this. It's gonna be a little short line here, then we're gonna come over, then a, a, almost like a stepped area that comes down to the bottom and then we're gonna create a vertical line here, we're gonna create another horizontal line, we're gonna come down at an angle and then we're gonna close off that sketch. So if I turn off my uh, uh, sketch relationships just so it's a little bit easier to see, those of you that are following along with, that's kind of what you want your sketch to look like. And what that represents is this little indented area in the bottom coming over, moving down a little bit, coming over for the wall thickness on the bottom, moving straight up the sidewall, moving straight across in for that sidewall, and then drafting down just at a slight angle as we go down into the mug, and then finishing off with a horizontal line at the bottom. So now when it comes time to measuring those diameters, I'm gonna say that this overall diameter of the mug is about 83 millimeters. So we're gonna go here, smart dimension, and we're gonna create a dimension that goes from this line to the center line. I'm gonna come over here, and I'm gonna say 83 for that overall diameter. Now the ID at the top is gonna to be, let's call that 76. So I'm gonna just pick this one single point here and look at that, I'm already in that double dimension. Pretty sweet, right? And then I'm gonna pick this vertical edge down here and I'm gonna measure that and I'm gonna say that that is, call that one 74, a little bit thicker at the bottom there. So call that one 74. Now I'm going to create a dimension that goes from this lower horizontal line to this line here, and you'll notice that I'm, I'm still in that special kind of doubled uh, doubled dimension mode. Oh, and this is gonna be a dubby, dummy dimension here, don't worry about this dimension. I'm still in that double dimension mode, but if I pick a line that's perpendicular, I get an angle to that vertical line, and then if I pick another horizontal line here, SolidWorks just says, oh, okay, you don't wanna be in that double dimension mode anymore, and just automatically jumps me into the next mode. So now I can say that that is gonna be a two millimeter a uh, little divot on the bottom if I measure the depth to the bottom. I'll say the wall thickness here at the bottom is going to be four millimeters. And then the final dimension that I need to put in is going to be the, um, the overall height of the mug. So we'll make the overall height of the mug here 96. So that's going to be from this. I always do the line instead of the point. Um, it's just 
it's a stronger dimension, uh, meaning that it's less susceptible to making uh, uh, an edit. Uh, but you could actually do the line here. I mean, it's it gets a little bit nuanced as to which one is better uh, because you get into uh, the calculation for how much time are you saving. So that's like a, a very uh, a pretty pretty variable. Uh, equation right because it's like how much time are you saving by doing it one way or another that really depends on the person but if you create a dimension here from line to line it is a little bit stronger than creating a dimension just along this line here because that's actually from end point to end point so just take that for what it's worth all right and now i'm going to create one final dimension which is going to be the draft angle and i'm going to say that that draft angle is going to be uh, two degrees per side to four degrees total. So the way that we do this when we're working with the center line is with the shift key on our keyboard. You press down on the shift key on your keyboard. So here I'm going to create an angle dimension from this vertical edge over to here. Now you notice if I cross over on this one, it doesn't give me the double dimension. It's when I hold shift that I get the double dimension there for an angle. Shift is what's going to let you do that. And then I'm going to make that four degrees. Okay, and that for some reason always jams all the way down at the bottom. We're just going to move that up, no problem. And I hope that you guys liked it. If you guys like any of those little tips, let me know in the chat. Um, and Innocent Marto says, nice work. Thank you very much. All right, cool. All right, and thanks for the feedback also regarding the cursor feedback. I appreciate that. And shout out to Andrew Barnes, who says that The Expanse is one of his favorite sci-fi shows. All right, cool. So now we're going to perform a revolve command. So features revolve, and we're going to revolve about the same center line that we used for our double dimensions, which means that when we're done here, we're going to see that we've got diameter symbols on these edges of our, our circular revolve. So SolidWorks automatically added in those diameter symbols because we created that using the revolve command and revolved about the same center line. All right, awesome. Let's move on here and talk about our next feature, which is going to be the handle. Now, before the presentation got started, what I did was I took some photos of what I ultimately think this handle is going to look like, and I sent those photos over to my computer. So here you can see the Windows directory uh, containing those photos. And take a notice here of the image size. So uh, one of these is the image itself, which is 5 meg, um, because I'm using you know a, a pretty decent phone here, pretty decent uh, uh, camera on that phone. The other one here is just a screenshot. And this is something I just wanted to mention real quick here in passing, is that a lot of times on your phones, there'll be a set, or even on any camera, there'll be a section where you can designate a grid for taking photographs to help you center your photos um, or to help you kind of control where your photos are. But this is also really helpful for determining vertical when you are creating a picture that you're going to be using in SolidWorks. So when you're when you're creating a picture like what we're using here and it's important that the, uh, the edges for that loft are vertical, this just makes it easier. You can rotate it in post-processing too, but this just makes it a little bit easier. So just if you're doing this a lot, look out for that. It'll save you a little bit of time. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in on this file and I'm just going to uh, capture the information that I need. And you can do this as simply as using the Windows snipping tool. Like this doesn't have to be a fancy process. And now I'm going to save this. And when I go to save this, I'm going to save this in that same directory. I'll call it uh, mug handle. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look back at Windows Explorer and look at the difference here in file size. So that original image was 5 meg. Right? So think about this. If you're emailing these files around or if you're checking them into the vault, that's 5 meg of additional data. The part itself is probably only going to be like 200K, right? And you're, you're sending out 5,000K or 5 meg of data. You're emailing around 5 meg of data or, or shipping that. You know, It's really unnecessary. It's going to make everything slower. And you really don't want to have that level of detail embedded into your part file. It's not necessary. So instead, you know, take a moment, keep an eye on your file sizes. And when you're doing something like this, try to create a lower file size. It'll really save you a lot of heartache and it'll save you a lot of storage space too uh, in your vault. All right. So now we're ready to bring that picture in. But the, uh, the problem is we don't really know how big we're, we're working with, right? The area we're working with. So we're going to just measure kind of like a rectangular area here on the handle. So I'm going to use uh, the depth gauge on this thing and say that that's going to be about, it's sticking out about 39 millimeters and that the overall handle height here, so we'll say 39 by about, so we'll say here it's 39 by about 
um, we'll say 73. 39 by 73. So I'm going to go front plane, begin a sketch, orient my view, and I'm going to say that I want this to be 39 by 73. So 73 high, 39 wide. Um, I'll also put in maybe a little bit of additional information like a center line that's going to help me with centering up my geometry. I'm going to say that I want this to hook tangent to uh, the existing model so I could make it collinear to the silhouette edge. Or another thing that I'll do a lot is I'll go back and show the earlier sketch and then I'll actually pick the entity off the earlier sketch and make these two collinear. It's just like I said earlier, it's a little bit stronger when you're relating the things that are less susceptible to change. So if I was worried that maybe this face is going to get drafted or there's you know some other manipulation might occur on this face, I could create the relationship back to the original sketch, which is going to just make my overall model a little bit stronger. All right, so now that we've got that relationship on there, this thing's looking good. The only thing I need to do is indicate uh, how, how far up this handle is. So just get this guy here. Again, using the depth gauge. We'll say that the handle starts out at about 13 millimeters up. So those of you that are following along with, um, I hope that I'm giving you enough information here as far as dimensions go, 13 millimeters up. All right, so 39 by 73 and 13 millimeters up. And uh, then usually at this point, a, a lot of times I'll wait until I get one or two features in. I'll just go through and start renaming my tree. So I click on the tree here. I press the F2 key on my keyboard and I'll call this one uh, main mug revolve or just main mug, we'll just call it that. And then I'll call this one main mug sketch. And then I'll call this one layout for handle. Uh, sometimes I'll put image on the end there. And then I'll hide that original sketch. I don't need to see that anymore. And then I'll do a control S. So another good shortcut that I use all the time is control and the letter S for save. And then I'll save this file in here. I'll call this uh, live design coffee mug. All right, cool. And really, this thing should probably be out of ceramic. So I'm going to right mouse button on material and say edit material. And then new in SolidWorks 2020, we can search the material library. I love this. So I'm going to type in CER. I'm going to search the material library. Oh, yeah. What a nice time saver. All right, cool. So now we got this thing made out of a ceramic porcelain. I think we're in good shape here to move on. All right, cool. What's up, Corey? See Corey in the chat asking a question. No intersection curve. Not necessary on this one, Corey, but you know I do love intersection curve. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's a lot of floppies, Andrew says. Yep. All right, uh, you're going to trace the handle. Arun says, yes, that's exactly what I'm going to do, Arun. And it's a great question. And in this spot, it's totally acceptable because what am I using this for? I'm using this design to come up with a 3D printed coupling, essentially, to go between the cup holder in my car and this mug. So as long as I'm within a millimeter or two, I'm golden, right? If this was some kind of a medical application, I might not have that luxury. So it's all about trying to figure out what the end use is, and then you can determine what your tolerancing is going to be. That's exactly what we're going to do. So now we're going to go here to the front plane again. Oh, and one more thing I like to do is I like to right mouse button on this layout sketch and say sketch color. And then I make it something that's really going to pop through the, uh, the image that I drop in there. So just for sake of comparison, let me leave that as the original gray color. And I'm going to go front plane, begin a sketch, orient my view. And then I'm going to bring in tools, sketch tools, sketch picture. Tool, sketch, tool, sketch, picture. I know it's at the very bottom. It's actually off the screen. Um, I noticed this, uh, that it did go off the screen, but it's at the very bottom there. Tools, sketch tools, and then just come over here and go all the way down to the bottom here and you'll get to sketch picture. And now I'm able to browse to a location where that picture is stored. So here's that mug handle picture. And then you're gonna be presented with this guy. And this guy here is what's known as the sketch scaling tool. Um, you can see over here, there's a check mark for it. It says enable sketch or enable scale tool, uh, sketch picture scaling tool, excuse me. And so what this sketch picture scaling tool lets me do is let me drag this bar here to a certain point in my picture. So the first thing I do is I grab the magenta dot and I drag that onto my picture. And then I grab, oh, you know what I just realized? Uh, you guys who are following along with don't have this picture yet, right? So let me 
just leave this up on the screen for a second. Totally forgot that. I apologize. Uh, but if you want to just take a quick screenshot of this, if you haven't already, uh, go ahead and do a window snipping tool. And that way you can grab the same picture uh, and then you'll be able to follow along with. I apologize for that. Let me uh, refill my coffee while you guys are doing that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Just realized I missed that step. All right, cool. All right, awesome. All right, so now that we've all got that picture in there, let's let's continue this discussion of this enable sketch or enable scale tool. So what this enable scale tool lets us do is it lets us take this magenta dot and drag it to a certain point on our picture. So I'll drag it right there. And then we can take this arrow and drag it to another point on our picture. And SolidWorks will say, okay, the current distance from this point to this point on your picture is 198. What is it supposed to be? So now what I'm going to do is type in that value that I pulled from the, from the part. And I, I don't remember what the value was. I think it was 34, but I'll just take it again here. 30, 39. So I'm going to take that same value and I'm going to type that in 39. And what SolidWorks does for me is it automatically resizes that image so that the distance from the start to the end of that arrow is now 39 millimeters. And so it resized the picture as well to get it to that size. So that's how that uh, image scaling tool works. If you've never worked with that before, that's the gist of how it works. And you can see in this spot, it worked out pretty good. It, it got me pretty close. But if it doesn't, what I'll do is I'll drag this image into place and then I will uncheck this option for enable scale tool. And then I'll just grab these arrows here and resize it as I need to. There's a check mark for uh, the option for um, aspect ratio. So if the aspect ratio needs to be changed, you can uncheck that check check box. Uh, there's also uh, there's also an option for rotate. So if the angle's not correct, if it's not you know perfectly straight or if it needs to be adjusted, you can adjust that. You know, a lot of times I'll do this in very subtle increments, half a degree or a tenth of a degree until I get it to just the right spot where it's laid out onto my overall kind of layout geometry. And like I said, um, a lot of times what I do is earlier in the design on the layout image, I'll right mouse button, I'll go to sketch color, and I'll change that sketch color just so that it pops through a little bit easier. It's a little bit easier for me to see how that's lined up. The last thing I want to say about this image is that uh, to, to edit the image, you just double click on it. Uh, so I'm here in sketch mode. I went back into the sketch of that image. I'm double clicking on the image to edit it. And a lot of times I go down here to full image and I just adjust the transparency on the image. It makes it a little easier to see through if you've got geometry behind the image that you want to reference. You can set the transparency to be something a little bit less than perfectly opaque. All right, I think this thing looks pretty good. I think everybody looks pretty good. Everybody in the uh, uh, chat is saying this looks good. All right, awesome. Good, good, good. All right, cool. Looking at the chat, everybody's looking pretty good here. All right, awesome. Yeah, I am using 2020 here. Uh, the question came in from Jassard. Uh, what version are you using? Or, or maybe it was, uh, maybe Jassard answered that. Um, but the, uh, the result here, uh, or the, the functionality that I'm showing here, is all available in earlier versions of the software with the exception of search for material. That's the only thing I showed that's new in 2020. Everything else I'm showing here, you can use even if you're using an earlier version of the software. So um, hopefully that helps answer your questions if you're trying to follow along with the recording or with the live stream. All right, I'm going to rename that. So I, I go in the tree and I press F2, and I'm going to rename that to uh, image of handle. And then I'm going to do control S for save. All right, we're ready to move on. Front plane, begin a sketch, orient the view. So we go front plane here, begin a sketch, orient the view. And now we're going to start creating the spline geometry for our guides. Now, for me, what I like to do is I like to use the actual uh, spline command, the regular old, uh, old fashioned, if you will, spline command. And with the spline command, what you're able to do is you're able to click on the spline and you get these things here called spline handles. Uh, this is an example here of a spline handle. It's got three parts, basically. It's got a little dot at the end, it's got uh, an arrowhead, and then it's got a uh, diamond. And these let you control things like the uh, magnitude of tangency influence at the point with the arrowhead, and the angle of tangency influence, and also let you control both if you grab the dot. Um, it doesn't really matter what that means. All that really matters is that you're able to grab these and drag these around to manipulate the spline until you get the geometry to look like the geometry from, in this case, from our image. 
right, the geometry that we're going for, which is the geometry from the image. So this is what I prefer to use. Um, you know, I, when I'm making a model like this, this is probably what I would use. But I'm trying to challenge myself. I'm trying to expand uh, my boundaries. I'm trying to learn a little bit more about the software. This is kind of how splines worked in the old days. But there are some newer tools that make this process a little bit more elegant. Um, so uh, I see here that Andrew in the chat says, why don't you use style spline? Um, and that's exactly what I'm going to use here. So instead of using the traditional spline, I'm going to erase this traditional spline and I'm going to go in and I'm going to create this using style spline. So just kind of trying, like I said, trying to expand my capabilities, you know, expand what I know about the software. Um, now, Understanding what this st style spline should look like is just a matter of experience, you know, predicting kind of that this shape here, uh, which, you know, comes up at an angle, goes down, goes actually inside the handle, comes back out, comes back down, comes back over. You know, understanding that that's the correct shape uh, to get you started is really just something you're going to learn from experience. But for those of you that are following along with, I went to style spline here. And then I'm going to single click in here, kind of in the handle region, kind of up above, kind of out here down on the center line, back out here again, almost like I'm making a heart, right? Almost like I'm making a, you know, like I love SolidWorks. So almost like I'm making a, a, a heart here uh, and then come back into the inside, something like this. Uh, the nice thing about the style spline that uh, you don't really have the option to do, uh, I'll, I'll just say the nice thing about the style spline is that you can easily make these points uh, mirrored with a regular spline you can make points mirrored but you don't mirror the tangency influence so for example I could take this point and this point and this point and I can make their location symmetric but that doesn't make the tangency influence symmetric so you can see here that this arrow now is much shorter than this arrow down here the tangency influence is not necessarily symmetric so it sometimes yields an asymmetric result if you're not you know really paying attention with this one, you know, these points are defining both the tangency influence and the angle. Um, so by making these, these points here symmetric, I'm covering both as long as I get all the points. So I'll make that point symmetric. I'll make this point here symmetric. So the way that I'm doing that is I'm just uh, picking one, holding control, picking the other, and then letting go of control. Let me just do that again. So I'm going to take this point here, pick this point, hold control, pick the center line, continue to hold control, pick this point, and then I let go of control, and that's when this little toolbar pops up and I make those symmetric. Pick this point, hold control, pick this point, or this line, pick this point down here, let go of control, make those symmetric. This is a new line that I created in this sketch, by the way. Uh, I didn't verbalize it, but this is a new center line that I just made in this sketch. Pick this point, hold control, pick this new center line, pick this point, let go of control, and make those symmetric. And then this final point here, I just need to drag it onto the center line or make it coincident. I'm also gonna take this uh, spline and make it tangent to this line here on the side. And I'm gonna take this spline and make it tangent to this line here up top. And now the only thing left to do is a little bit of dragging of these points here to manipulate the spline until I get it to more or less follow uh, that handle layout. So we just drag these points around a little bit and boom, there we go, it's looking good. Um, for those of you who are following along with and want to put some dimensions on here, you could, uh, I'm just going to drop these dimensions in here, 75, 100, you know, we'll just make this a little bit easier so everybody can follow. Um, a lot of times you kind of eyeball this up, but you know, we'll say that one's going to be uh, 10 on the inside, you know, 10 to the inside. Uh, these points here are going to be, oh, already defined, uh, and We'll say this is going to be 16, and this point here from the origin. You don't have to do this, um, but if you do want to follow along and get exactly the same results as me, this is what the dimensions would look like. All right, cool. Chat saying it looks good. All right, awesome. Let's keep going on here. We're going to exit that sketch, and we're going to rename that loft guide top outer top whatever it's fine uh and now we're just basically going to rinse and repeat here so we're going to go front plane begin a sketch orient the view in fact it's going to be such a similar guide on the inside that we could almost take this uh, loft guide top control c on our keyboard click the front plane Control V on our keyboard to paste that into place. I'm going to hide the previous one so I don't get confused. And then I'm going to um, edit this sketch here. 
and I'm just going to get rid of some of these dimensions. And now I've, you know, I've basically given myself kind of a good starting point for this. So I'll take these two and make them collinear. I'll take this point and just drag it onto the center line. And now I'm in pretty good shape to just kind of move these points back. You know, I've already got that symmetry in place. So this is going to make my life a little bit easier to kind of get these, uh, this geometry into the right spot here. So I take that point, move it down, take this point, move it down. And there we've got our inside curve. And again, for those of you that are following along with, I will throw some dimensions on these. Um, but, you know, that's that's kind of the gist of how you would create that outer curve and that inner curve. Now, I realize that there is an extra little kind of bulge there. Um, and we could, you know, turn this into uh, an, a fairly elaborate surfacing exercise and, and fix that little bulge area or incorporate that little bulge area into our design. Whoops. Um, so what I mean is this area right here. But do we really need to do that? I mean, if we're making this for retrofitting a coffee mug holder into our vehicle, do we really need to include that little bulge? Do we need to spend an hour or two hours modeling that up when it's not even going to be part of our design? Um, I don't think we do. So I'm not going to do it. But if you guys want to, you can. <laughs> All right, just a couple more dimensions here. Uh, let's see here. We'll grab this point and define it from here. And we'll grab, what else we got? This width here. All right, again, for those of you that are following along with, uh, if you want to, you know, screenshot that, that's kind of what that inside curve might look like. And we can pull that down a little more too, you know, that, that inside curve, um, it does, you know, it does come down a little bit further. So we could do something like pulling that in a little bit more, pulling that other point out. Um, I think it's fine for what we're trying to illustrate today. Let's say I'll just pull that in a little bit and we'll call that 20. All right, everybody good? Cool? Okay. All right, everybody looks like they're good. I'm looking at the chat. All right. What's up? Say hi to Lucas from Brazil. What's up, Lucas? How you doing? I don't know if that actually was even directed at me. All right, focus here. <laughs> We're going to call this one Loft Guide Bottom. All right. So now what we've got is we've got these two uh, loft guide curves here. And I'm going to hide some of these uh, earlier sketches just so we don't see them. One thing I want you to notice about these guide curves uh, that's really going to be important for our design is that they are, let me just change the sketch color here. So I'm going to make the outside one red and I'm going to make the inside one blue, right mouse button sketch color. I'm going to make that one blue. And one thing that we're going to want to take note of is that there is a vertical plane that runs in this direction. We haven't created the plane yet, but what I'm saying is we've got the ability to cross over the start uh, and the end of our loft with this kind of what I'm going to call a vertical plane. And it's going to be important that you establish that, and it'll be helpful if you establish which one of these endpoints is further to the inside. So in other words, uh, this endpoint here is further to the inside. This one's further to the outside. So when I go to create my new plane, I'm going to create it right on this blue point, and, uh, and that way I'm going to be setting myself up to create my loft profiles in that region. If I created the plane out here on this red point, it's not going to work because I'm not going to be able to use what's called pierce when I go to create that loft profile. So just keep that in mind when you're creating this geometry is that it'll be uh, not only beneficial, it'll almost be required for you to uh, have that geometry uh, in a way that you can create the plane across both of them so that you can pierce that profile. The other thing is um, if you're looking at this thing in a wireframe or in a section view, you can see that we are inside of the inside wall with that blue point. So here's the inside wall here. Um, I'll just make it green, just to make it a little easier to see. So here's the, the inside wall here, circled in green. And then here's where our new plane is going to be uh, at the end point of that blue line. Uh, also on the inside of that wall, that's going to be helpful and it's going to make your life a lot easier. So with that, let's save the model, control S, and let's move on to our next feature, which is going to be the profile for our, um, uh, for our loft. So we can start out here by going to the top plane and I'm going to hold control on my keyboard and I'm going to grab this plane here and drag it up. So what I did there, a uh, real good valuable time saving tip is that I clicked on the plane and then I hold control and I look for the little four way arrow on the, the top plane, the, the plane that I 
I just clicked on it to highlight the border because that's where you have to drag it from. If it was already shown, I wouldn't have to do that step. But you can see here that when I go to the border of that plane, I get that little four-way arrow. Now I'm ready to hold control and drag from that arrow. And then I'm just going to click on this point here. And so SolidWorks now automatically put us into or shortcut put us into uh, create a plane mode. It allowed us to pick the top plane as our starting reference and parallel as the uh, new plane condition. And then that point that I selected coincident becomes our second condition for that new plane. So we're creating a new plane parallel to the top plane at that point. Nice, right? Nice and easy way to save, save time. So this will be center loft profile plane. And now I'm gonna pick on that plane, I'm gonna begin a sketch and I'm gonna sketch an ellipse. So our handle here is gonna be an ellipse in shape. And the location of that ellipse is going to utilize the pierce command. Now the pierce command is one that has been in the software for a long time, but it's a really important one to understand. Here I am on the front plane and I'm gonna create this line here like so. And I'm, I'm drawing it as an arrow because I want you to imagine it almost like a bow and arrow. Uh, the arrow is shooting right through the right plane. The arrow is shooting through the right plane. I'm gonna exit that sketch. I'm gonna go to the right plane and I'm gonna begin a new sketch. So that's the plane that's being pierced. I'm gonna begin a new sketch. And on this right plane, I'm gonna sketch a circle and I'm gonna say I want the center point of this circle to be coincident to this line. Center point of the circle coincident to this line. What's the solution? Well, the solution is it could really be anywhere along that line, right? It could be up here. It could be down here. Because when you make that point coincident to the line, you're taking that line and just projecting it into the current sketch plane. So I'm going to delete that and move that point over there. Now I'm going to do the same thing. But this time I'm going to choose pierce. I want to pick this point from the current sketch plane, hold control, pick this line, let go of control, and I'm going to choose pierce. And with pierce, there's only one solution. Wherever that line is piercing the current sketch plane is where this point is going to be moved to. So pierce, boom, there we go. One solution, black geometry, fully constrained. Pierce is really important, um, especially when you're working with lofts and sweeps and guide curves. So if you don't know about pierce yet, uh, just take this as a quick mini lesson on it and uh, be sure to take a moment and look it up a little bit uh, on the uh, on the YouTube. You can learn about all about Pierce. So for this example, I'm going to take this point here. I'm going to hold control. I'm going to pick this curve, which is passing through my sketch plane. Right, This is my guide curve passing through my sketch plane. And I'm going to choose Pierce. Okay, so when I choose pierce there, what happens is that ellipse moves, sorry, the, the um, feed got a little bit glitchy there. I'm gonna do it again. Pick this point, hold control, pick this curve, and then I'm gonna choose pierce. And you can see that the ellipse moved right on to that location, wherever this curve is passing through my sketch plane. And I'm gonna do the same thing with this one. Pick this point, hold control, pick this curve, the outer loft guide, and pierce. And there we go. We've got the location of our ellipse on the inside. Now, the last thing we need to do is figure out what the width of the handle is. So I'm just going to measure that. It looks pretty consistent all the way through, and that's going to be 16 millimeters all the way through. So we're going to say here that we want this to be 16 millimeters. Boom, done, fully constrained, and locked to the guide curve. So if the guide curve moves, I can expect that ellipse will get larger or smaller. So now I'm going to do the same thing, but this time I'm going to create a plane here. Let me hide the image because um, we don't need to see the image for this one. And I'm going to go here to the right plane and I'm going to hold control and I'm going to drag this right plane over. I'm not going to drag it to the red one, right? I'm going to drag it to the blue one, but it doesn't really matter where I drag it. So I'll just let it go there. So now I'm creating a new plane that's parallel to the right plane at 11.9 uh, millimeters. Now I'm going to single click on this point. I haven't clicked anything yet. I'm going to single click on this point and that's going to make a new plane parallel to the right plane at that location. So I hit the green check mark. And now once again, I'm going to begin a sketch. Once again, I'm going to create an ellipse. And once again, I'm going to choose to pierce this point of the ellipse to the red curve, pierce, and this point of the ellipse to the blue curve, pierce. And finally, what is the width of that ellipse? So it can be fully constrained. The width is going to be what did I say it was 19? 
Was it 19 or 14? Wait, let me measure this again. Or 16. <laughs> Looks like it's about 16. All right, 16. Okay. I'm gonna double check the other ellipse real quick just to make sure I got that right. So let's do some quick renaming here. So this is gonna be center loft profile. This is gonna be uh, top loft profile plane. And this is gonna be top loft profile. And then I'm going to um, just double check this one. Okay, 16, yep, 16, 16. I mean, it doesn't matter, it's a loft. I could have it get larger at the top if I wanted to. It doesn't really matter. All right, the final thing I'm gonna do here, this is just a little bonus. Uh, we could do, we could absolutely do the same thing down at the bottom, but I'm gonna do this a different way. I'm gonna use a command called derive sketch. This is a pretty cool command. It's a little bit advanced. Not everybody knows about this one, but it's a, it's a pretty good one. And you could definitely leverage it in a spot like this where you've got loft profiles where you want some of them to be different, but you want some of them always to be the same. So here's what derive sketch does. I'm gonna pick the uh, loft, top loft profile plane as a sketch plane. So this is this plane here. Let me let me hide these other sketches. We don't need to see them right now. We'll come back to them in a second. So top loft profile, there's what the sketch looks like, and there's the sketch plane that it exists on. So I'm gonna actually pick both of them. I'll pick them from the tree over here. So pick one, hold control, pick the other. So now I've picked a plane or a planar face, and I've picked a, uh, a sketch from the tree. And I'm gonna choose the command insert derived sketch, insert derived sketch. This won't be there if you don't pick those things first. If I go insert derived sketch, look, it's grayed out, right? Because I, I clicked in the background. They're not selected anymore. So I'm going to pick these two and I'm going to say insert derived sketch. And when I choose insert derived sketch, it's like, wait, what happened? Did anything happen? Yes, something important happened. I got this new sketch geometry of an ellipse on my sketch plane. But this is special geometry. You'll notice up here, all my sketch commands are unavailable. Right? I can't make a new circle. I can't make a new spline. I can't make any new sketch geometry. This new sketch that I just created is linked to the original sketch. If I do anything to the original sketch, so I'm gonna exit this one, I'm gonna go over to the original, I'm gonna say edit sketch, and I'm gonna change this from 16 to 24. And I'm gonna go back out to exit sketch and look, the derived sketch also changed to 24. Beyond that, if I create any additional geometry in the original sketch, this is so cool. The derived sketch picks up on that additional geometry. So the derived sketch is kind of like a, like a portal, right? <laughs> like, yeah, it's, it's, they are, they are uh, quantumly linked. They've got quantum entanglement. Um, that's what SolidWorks is doing, right? Quantum entanglement. Ask any other CAD system if they've got quantum entanglement and they're not going to say yes. Uh, chat, if you guys like quantum entanglement, let me know in the, in the chat. Let me know if you like that. Give me a thumbs up. Give me a heck yes. Give me plus one for quantum entanglement, whatever you can do. But uh, the idea of derived sketch is just that. You can see here that uh, when it comes to this original sketch, any changes I make to the original sketch are gonna carry right through into this new sketch. So I'm gonna change this back to 16 for the width of that ellipse. The other ellipse becomes 16, we lose the circle. Then I'm gonna go down here to my derived sketch and I'm going to uh, show my curves again. And I'm going to say this point is pierced to this point. Oh, heck yes. All right, good. We're getting some feedback here. People like quantum entanglement and derived sketch. And this point is pierced to this sketch. And we can see here now that we are nice and fully constrained, even though we don't have dimensions, because this is an exact replica of this, but dynamically linked, quantum entangled. All right, so now that we've got that geometry created, oh, and by the way, when you go to rename this, it will always say derived at the bottom. So I'll call this one uh, lower loft profile, and it will always throw derived on the end there automatically. So you don't have to type it manually. It always just does that automatically. All right, we're gonna save our model. We're gonna go here to loft, and our loft feature is going to go from this profile to this profile to this profile. It's important when you're selecting your profiles to kind of be conscious of where you're selecting so you don't get twisting. But when you've got guide curves, you don't even have to worry about that because the guide curves will straighten everything out. This is gonna be one of my guide curves and this is gonna be my other guide curve. And there you can see we've created that beautiful handle for that mug. We will hide some of those extra sketches. I just go out in the graphics area usually, click on what I want to hide and then click the little eyeball, click on that to hide it. 
Click on this to hide it. Click on this plane here to hide it. This thing's looking good. We'll call this uh, lofted handle and we will save. And this looks good, except we've got this extra kind of area on the inside, right? Got this extra little handle area on the inside here. So we could do a cut revolve to clean that up, but a way more elegant solution is gonna be insert, face, delete. And when you go to the command insert face delete, you're going to see that SolidWorks will automatically do some surface patching for you. SolidWorks will actually go through and clean up those bad areas for you. So normally, if we did an insert face delete and we just said delete, we're now turning this model into a surface model and we're going to end up with something like this big old hole in the side of that wall. That's not what we want. But instead, when we go to insert face delete, we can say delete and patch. And basically what SolidWorks is gonna do here is it's gonna do an extend surface on the area that's missing. So it's gonna extend these surfaces out and patch these surfaces and, and fix those surfaces up for us automatically just by going to insert face delete. Beautiful, right? Beautiful. Insert face delete. We could actually get all four of them in one shot or we could do it in two different ones if we wanted to. I'm gonna do it again just because I think it, it bears repeating. Insert face delete. Pick the area that you want to get rid of, ideally leaving yourself with a nice patch area to let SolidWorks patch in. Hit the green check mark and boom, we've cleaned up those inside surfaces. So the final features for this thing are going to be these kind of final fillets and rounds just to, just to you know, finish up cleaning this thing up. So we're going to go in here first with a fillet command and we're going to say this is going to be a 10 millimeter fillet in this little, actually we'll make it a little smaller, let's make it like seven millimeters in this little area that's only got a two millimeter gap. But no problem, no problem for SolidWorks. What SolidWorks does is it just makes a tangent to this region here and then runs it off into the available edge. Wherever the available edge is, that's where it stops. If this ledge happened to get long enough to accommodate the entire fillet, then we would have tangent, tangent. But in this spot, it's only gonna be tangent on one face and it just holds this original edge here and boom, we're golden. So another type of fillet that we can create is another, we're gonna do another fillet here on the inside and we want to accomplish something similar. We wanna create a fillet here that is not rounded the same in both directions, an elliptical profile for a fillet essentially. And believe it or not, this functionality is available right in the basic edge fillet command. You don't even have to do a, a face face fillet to do this. Um, right in the basic edge fillet, when I click on that inside edge, I can go down here to where it says fillet parameters and I can say, asymmetric and then I'm gonna get two dimensions just like an ellipse so I can say asymmetric here and then you can see that I could change this so that one dimension maybe is uh, four millimeters and the other dimension is eight millimeters so it's twice twice the distance in one direction and you can see I can also flip this so I can flip this in either direction leaving me with this nice asymmetric fillet in that region without having to do any surfacing without having to do anything fancy with face fillets or anything like that so that's another kind of cool trick that you can remember when it comes to fillets. Now, this top edge of the model, you can see that I really want this to be fully rounded off. We've all been in this spot before, right, where we've done this with edge fillets. So I'm going to make this symmetric again, and then I'm going to pick this edge here, and I'm going to pick this edge here on the inside, and I'm going to try to come up with the perfect number, right? So is it one millimeter? Uh, one millimeter looks pretty close, but I still get a little bit of a ledge there. Is it 1.2? Is it 1.4? Right? We've all done this before. I know I've done this before. You want to try and get that perfect number to give yourself that nice full round. Well, what's beautiful about SolidWorks is that it has a tool built in to figure out that number for you, right? Because this is a drafted face here, so um, it's, it's not going to be an easy calculation necessarily. So what we can do is we can choose this last option here, which is full round fillet. And with full round fillet, you pick one face in this first box. We'll call that a side face. And you pick one face in this middle box. We'll call that a top face to be removed. Top face to be removed. And then we'll pick one more face here. We'll call this the second side face. So side face one, top face to be removed, side face two. And you can see that what's going to happen is we're going to end up with a full round fillet that is tangent to that top face that we are removing. And you can see here, it's gonna go tangent to the side wall, tangent to the imaginary wall, and tangent to the other side wall, leaving us with that perfect, nice, full round fillet up top. Oh yeah, I like that, that is looking good. 
One thing I always remind uh, my students about when it comes to full round fillet is that it's a great opportunity to practice your right clicking skills, right click advance through. So what we're gonna see is that when we click on this first face, the mouse is gonna change to say, if you right click, it's kind of like a carriage return. If you right click, you're gonna be bounced from this box into this box. If you right click again, you're gonna be bounced from this box into this box. And if you right click again, you're gonna be hitting the green check mark. So the way that this looks in practice is, I'm out here doing a full round fillet. I pick this first face. I right click. SolidWorks advances me to the next box. I pick this face. I right click. SolidWorks advances me to the next box. I click this face. I right click. SolidWorks finishes the command. So this is a great tool that you can use to practice you know, honing your right click advanced skills, uh, that full round fillet, because when you're doing this in real time, when you have to fill it, let's say you have to fill it 10 different ribs, it's really nice to be able to go click, right click, click, right click, click, right click, move on to the next rib, repeat, repeat, repeat. All right, let's save this model. I think we got time for one more fillet here. So the final fillet that we're gonna do here is gonna be on the handle itself. And this is something that um, has been in the software for a little while, but it's, uh, it's a face fillet. It's a function of face fillet. And what I'm referring to here is the fact that if we create a fillet here, uh, going from this face to this face, which we could just do this with a regular edge fillet as well, we'd end up with the same result. The fillet looks a little bit funky. And the reason it looks a little funky, in my opinion, is because the distance from this tangency point to this tangency point is different from the distance from this tangency point to this tangency point. I mean, you can even see vertically, they just kind of start at a different location. Um, and the reason for this is because of the, the angle of intrusion for that fillet, right? This is a, a different angle of intrusion for that fillet. And so we get kind of a different result uh, going all around the fillet. So what we've done, you know, what I've done in the past is I've gone in and done maybe a, a variable edge fillet. And what I'll do is I'll just kind of go around the fillet until I get things to look uh, kind of the way that I want them to. So maybe I would make that vertex five and I would make this vertex two. And, and just like through trial and error, maybe that's the one that needs to be two. Maybe this one needs to be four. Through trial and error, I would ultimately get to something like this where that line is almost being held vertical. But what we can do with the face fillet when you're in a spot like this is we can go fillet, face fillet, pick this face. And again, for me, I'm always gonna be doing right mouse button to advance. So right mouse button is the carriage return. Now I'm in the next box, pick this face. And then down here, instead of saying symmetric, there's another option in here for face fillet called cord width. And so now I'm actually generating a variable fillet but SolidWorks is kind of doing that legwork for me to make this thing look good. Um, you can see here that I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this one, and just to make it a little easier to see, I'm gonna go view, display, tangent edge, visible. And then I'm gonna create another fillet down below here using a traditional, uh, traditional fillet on this edge. So you can kind of see the difference there, the, the before and after, right? This one's using the face fillet with the cord width. This one's using the traditional constant radius fillet. And for me, I just think this one looks better. It's just more aesthetically pleasing. It looks a little more constant. When you have corners coming together with draft, this can be really, really handy. So one last feature here, we're gonna go here to the fillet command. We're gonna go here to face fillet. We're gonna click this face here, right mouse button, click this face here. And we're gonna come down to the bottom and say cord width, hold that cord width consistent between those. Let SolidWorks kind of do the work for me and Oops, I think I, oh, I picked, sorry about that. I inadvertently picked the face of the, um, of the other fillet. All right, well, nothing like the very last feature of the day giving you a hard time. You know what? I actually did that on purpose. I wanted you guys to be able to see the difference between the two. So that's why I did that on purpose. Um, I think what's probably happening here is that this face runs into this face here at two spots. That's my theory. So to resolve that, what I would do is I would um, just do a split line real quick. So I've already got that plane uh, for the center of the handle. So I would go here to curves split line and I would go intersection. So now this is two separate discrete faces and then I would just try it again. Face, right mouse button, face, changes to hold line. Uh, no, not hold line, cord width and we're golden. There we go. And then view, display and tangent edges removed. 
So control Q just to rebuild the whole model, control S to save the model. And that is going to bring us to the end of the presentation. So <clears throat> I hope you guys enjoyed that. What's up, Mike Puckett? Mike Puckett in the chat. SolidWorks superstar, SolidWorks certification superstar. Just looked over in the chat and saw it. Uh, I'm going to uh, answer any questions that come up in the chat, but I do want to say, you know, most importantly, thank you all so much for tuning in. We really appreciate having you guys in here. Um, we really hope that this is helpful. Let us know, you know, in the chat if you think that this is helpful, um, if this is going to help you as you're maybe stuck at home, as you're trying to brush up on some old skills. Let us know down in the comments below as well. We're definitely interested in hearing any comments that you have. Um, we are going to be doing this again on Friday with Brian Zaya. Brian is in the chat, so if I'm wrong there, let me know, Brian. But we are going to be doing this on Friday. Brian's going to be doing a flexible monitor mount, so I'm sure we're going to be able to see some cool tips. But it looks like we're getting some great feedback in the chat. Shout out to Jacob. What's up, Jacob? Thanks for tuning in. Juan, thanks a lot for the nice, kind words. All right. You like this split line, uh, Maha? The, thank you for that. Yep. Uh, that was something that I was like, why is this failing? Oh, yeah. Maybe it uh, needs a discreet face. All right, cool. Nuno, uh, great seeing you in here. Thanks so much. What's up, Eric Beatty, SolidWorks Users Group Superstar and SolidWorks Superstar in general. Welcome to the chat. We got, looks like we got Oogly Boogly in here. It says, dang, SolidWorks is awesome. Nice. All right, well, thank you guys so much. Um, I know that we're at the two o'clock hour, so I know you may have to jump out and get back to work, but um, you're welcome to stick around in the chat. I'm happy to answer any questions you have, but I really hope you guys like this series. I'm looking forward to hopefully uh, doing more of them. Uh, I've enjoyed being the host today, and we've got an amazing team of presenters that are gonna be coming at you. Uh, the next one's coming up on Friday, and I believe we're gonna be doing them every Monday and Friday uh, for the foreseeable future. So, you know, if you guys enjoy this, be sure to tune back in to SolidWorks Live design on Friday, and we'll look forward to seeing y'all next time. Bye-bye, and I'll be hanging out in the chat, saying hello to everybody for just a few more minutes. All right, Javadez, thank you so much for tuning in. You were uh, you were the first one, right? You're the first one in the chat, so uh, great, to, great to see you making it all the way through here to the end. Uh, let's see here. Oh, I lost my place. Got lots of great stuff here. Okay, great. All right. The handle is still solid. Uh, uh, Sudha, Su, Sudha, Shu, Sudan, Shu, uh, Sudan, Shu. Yes, the handle is absolutely still solid, even though we did delete face because when you do delete and patch, let me just show you the, the screen again here. Question came in from Chad. Is the handle still solid? Absolutely. Um, you can see here if we do a section view uh, right off the front plane that the handle is still absolutely solid because when we do that delete and patch, SolidWorks is taking care of all those surfacing tools for us all in one command. So that's where delete face is so powerful. You don't need to be a surfacing expert and you're still leveraging the power of surfacing in the background. Absolutely, yeah, great question. Okay, jumping back into the chat here. All right, uh, Paul on, thank you so much for tuning in. Mike, Mike Savocek, thanks a lot. Great seeing you here. I know you're doing one of these soon, so I'm looking forward to seeing yours. Uh, Titan, great, great job. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, can you work SolidWorks with a uh, Huion tablet? Uh, I'm not sure, but we are touch capable and pen capable now. So, um, you know, it would just be a matter of getting the right drivers, I think, and then you'll be golden on that. Uh, I think that's uh, John. All right, Adash, very helpful. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, Barry, good deal. Good seeing you in here. Thanks a lot. What's up, Sandy? Thank you. Got it worked. Uh, drive block, drive sketch versus block is my only question. Which do you prefer? Good question, Chris. Um, I don't work with blocks enough to, to be able to say. Um, I don't have enough experience with the dynamic linking between blocks. So I'm sure that there's going to be a little bit of overlap there. That would be my biggest question is, um, you know, to test that. And you want to remember that derive sketch, you're kind of stuck with what you have in the source sketch, where uh, when it comes to a block, you can explode the block, you can edit the block, you can, you know, you have a little bit more modification capabilities with the block. So um, it may be like so many things, it may just be depending on the situation. Okay, let's see here. All right, uh, CT SUG Users Group says, yep, keep idea, a uh, great idea, keep it up. Let's keep doing it. CSC says, thank you, Toby, appreciate it. Uh, Siraj, thank you so much, sir. Yep, good, glad you liked it. All right, uh, we got Jordan in here. He says, two minutes to spare. Yep, I do what I can, Jordan. Uh, we got Jonathan in here. Thanks a lot for the tips. Good, glad you like it. Come on back on Friday for some more. Good, all right, Francisco liked it. Thank you, Francisco. Carlos, good, awesome. 
Uh, Nuno, uh, I hope so too. Yep, and I hope this time frame works for you. This this wor- seems like it works well for our European friends. So Nuno appreciated your feedback a few weeks ago, letting me know what times work better for you. All right, Corey likes this. Uh, yep, and Sh- Shap Yuzat Shap Yuzat says thanks, Toby. My pleasure. All right, and Gabriel likes it. Smooth recovery. <laughs> you noticed that, huh, Gabriel? Yeah, wasn't sure what was going on there with that that last feature. Um, all right, great. Zori likes this. Okay, uh, Ta- Tom Arua, Aurora, Tom Arura Station says, Unreal, learn more in this last hour. Thanks, uh, been struggling for so long. Please keep it going. See you Friday. All right, awesome. Looks like we got a regular fan who's going to keep tuning in. So thanks a lot for that. Okay, see you, Francisco. Thanks for tuning in. Maybe I'll see you in a future one. All right, and Ib- Ibrahim, Ibrahim says, Thank you, Toby. My pleasure, Ibrahim. Uh, and R- Rajandar says, excellent, thanks. Looks like we got a lot of users working from home. Okay, and Carlos C says, a drive sketch masterclass, nice, thanks. Yeah, did you guys notice that it seems like every webinar that's posted uh, for the past two weeks has been a masterclass webinar? It's really uh, picking up on the, uh, I'm sure in like the Google keywords, if you did a keyword search on Google, you'd see masterclass more now than in the past couple of years. Uh, Moshan says, thanks, all right, my pleasure. Dennis, Dennis says, thanks for the cool tricks. Awesome. Glad you liked it. Gurav, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you, Gurav, for hanging with me in the beginning. Thanks, everybody, for hanging with me in the beginning uh, with the audio issues. We learned a lot in that that little uh, small section in the beginning. All right, Egypt. All right, awesome. Glad you're here. Glad we got the crew from Egypt here. Just kind of working through some of these uh, these chats. I want to make sure I don't miss anybody. I just It just jumped, so all right. Andres, uh, that fillet, uh, can you pick all one face in one operation? No, I don't think you can do it for that one, Andres. Usually when you're doing face fillets, you're doing uh, one face to another face. And since I was using, I mean, ultimately I was using three discrete faces there at the end. I don't think you're going to be able to do that in one spot. I think you're going to have to um, split it up. What's the best advice for beginners? Here's a question that came in from uh, Waylid. What's the best advice for beginners? Best advice for beginners is to uh, take your time and make sure your sketches are fully defined and make sure you're thinking a lot about design intent. Um, What design intent means is if I make a change to this sketch, can I predict how the model is going to react? Or if I make a change to this dimension, can I predict how the model is going to react? Um, you want to make sure your models are predictable. That's what it's all about. If I go into this model here that we just created together and I change the height of the mug, the overall height of the mug, what's going to happen to the handle? Is it going to stay in place or is it going to also move when I change the height of the mug? Right? Can I predict that? If I can predict that, then I have good design intent, and that's based on how my sketches were created. So take your time when you're creating your geometry. Okay, when you're when you're first getting started with SolidWorks, take your time. If you create geometry like this, uh, th- let's say we make this three inches by two inches, fully defined. Right? Um, if we make a circle on here, and we create a sketch relationship to that circle, and that sketch relationship locks that circle down at the uh, at the center of that rectangle and that circle has a diameter dimension on it of 0.75 and I change this height from three inches to six inches, what's gonna happen to the circle? Is it gonna stay in place or is it gonna move with that change? It's gonna move, right? I can predict that, my sketches are predictable. I have good design intent. Practice, practice, practice that good design intent because a lot of the downstream success that people find in SolidWorks is based on this one basic lesson. Keep practicing your design intent. Always fully define your sketches, right? Always get in there and fully define your sketches. Practice your design intent, and you're going to have a lot of success uh, when it comes to working on downstream operations in SolidWorks. So um, fully define your sketches, fully define every time, uh, and make sure that you are practicing good design intent and and asking yourself that question, hey, if I change it, can I predict what's going to happen? If you can, then you're doing things right. Okay. All right. We got some good, uh, good feedback here. I just want to say thanks to everybody. Um, all right. We got people from all over the world. So thank you all so much. Desard, thanks. Good. Glad you had a good time. Zuri, thanks. Uh, Mustafa, good. Just started working with SolidWorks and you're liking it. That's awesome. Welcome, welcome. Uh, what if the guideline is not planar? It's okay. Uh, so a question came in here from uh, Ket- Keterik. 
can. Uh, what if the guideline is not planar? That's okay. I mean, a lot of times with surface modeling, your guidelines are not planar, and it's fine. It still works the same way. You still pierce to your profiles, and then you sweep or you loft along your, your uh, curves. So it's okay if they're not planar. It's, it's something we do in surfacing all the time. It's possible to move a sketch from one sketch to another. I messed up uh, by mistake and sketched the image. Yeah, you can you can convert entities, but it's not the same thing. You could do a window select. So the question is, um, but, you know, I made this sketch here, and now I'm going to make another sketch uh, accidentally in the same read in the same sketch. You can always window select the geometry you want to move. Do a control. Oh, I'm not showing my screen. Sorry. You can always window select the geometry you want, you know, and then do a control X, which is a cut, and then go into the other sketch and do a control V. Um, if you have the image and the sketch in the same sketch, that's okay. I like to have them separated because then I can hide the image independent of hiding the sketch geometry, which I do a lot. But if they're in the same sketch, it's okay. It's not going to hurt you if they're in the same sketch. I just like splitting them up because um, I like having the discrete features to select in the tree and hide and show. That's the benefit of splitting them up. Oh, link for the model. Um, Andres is asking for a link for the model. I think we can do that. We can we can probably provide a link for the model, yeah. Um I'll, uh, I'll talk with the team and try to get it down in the description below. All right, hope to learn more from you. All right, thanks a lot, Glenn. That's very kind of you. Okay, I think I got most of this stuff. Link, another question for the link for the model. Yep, okay, I'll put that down. I'll get that into the description there, Andres. Great question. Uh, qu another question uh, from Oleg says, what... Uh, what would the result be if the center profile was removed and you were only using the loft between the top and the bottom profile? That's a great question, Oleg. Um, it would probably be the same uh, because the width isn't changing. So let's let's take a look. Uh, hopefully you're still here in the chat and and taking a look. So here here we can see the question is, you know, you're not you're not changing the width of the loft at the center, right? That's that's ultimately at the heart of the question. Um, we've got this loft here. I just rolled back in the tree. We've got the 16 here, 16 here, 16 at the bottom. Like, you're not changing the width, so why even have that centered uh, profile? You know, if this was 20, uh, or more likely if this was thinner, but it could go either way, if that was 20, right, then it would make sense to have that as a different value, um, to have that as a different discrete profile, I should say. But if it's the same, if it's 16, 16, 16, do we really even need that uh, center profile. So let's find out. It's a great question. You probably don't. I'm going to say you don't. I'm going to, I'm going to throw a prediction in there. Yeah. looks like we don't even really need that. Let's click on that and suppress it. Yeah. looks like you pretty much would get the same geometry. Um, there's always advantages to having those extra discrete features, uh, particularly when you're doing loft or even if you're doing a boundary, um, you could pick that discrete profile in the center and then say, I want to make sure that the as the as the boundary boundary loft, it's really called boundary. As the boundary comes into that handle, I want it to uh, remain perpendicular at all locations to that center profile. Because in definition of a boundary, you can do that. So that would be an advantage of having that middle one. Or like I showed a moment ago, if you wanted to change the width of the middle one, then you would need to have it. But um, if you didn't have those situations, yeah, you could just omit that altogether. Um, you could even do it as a sweep. You know, that's the other thing we didn't talk about. But you could even do it as a sweep. So if I let me roll to the end here and just save this so that, because um, I know there were some people who were uh, asking for the model. So let me just save this. And then I'm going to, let me save it as, and we'll call this one uh, mug-sweep. So we could even delete this and then choose to sweep. So I'm going to do a sweep here. This profile along and then for my path, I'll pick one of those guide curves. So I'll say, it doesn't matter which one, I'll pick this one. So I'm going to sweep that along this, this path. And then I could say, I'm going to use this other guide curve as a guide for that sweep. And you see, we get basically the same results. So now instead of lofting, I'm sweeping. I do get a different end, you know, slightly different ending to that uh, than I got with the loft. But other than that, it's the same. It's the same, pretty much the same geometry all the way through here. So that could be another potential solution. That's kind of something I alluded to in the beginning. Ugh, sorry, guys, I'm showing the... Uh, I'm not showing my webcam, or I'm only showing my webcam. So here I did a save as, and I rolled back, and I've got this, uh, uh, I've got these profiles in this path. Um, and now what I'm going to do is, instead of using a guide curve with lofts, I'm going to choose sweep, and I'm going to choose to sweep this profile along this path. And then I'm going to go down here to guide curves, and I'm going to say, I want the sweep to follow this guide curve. And you can see that we basically end up with the same results. 
So a lot of times when you learn a lot about sweeping and lofting, you learn that by using good practices for guide curves and for piercing your profiles, it's often that you can interchange between the two, uh, depending on what the, uh, the criteria of the design is. I'll save that one too in case anybody wants that one. All right, cool. We still got a lot of people in here. So can you do a simulation? How much uh, can the handle hold? Yeah, you could do that. You could do a simulation of this thing. Um, you know, you just apply the appropriate material. We're going to be covering that in a future version of this. But um, but yeah, you could you could definitely do it. I mean, the thing with simulation you always want to remember is that you're, uh, you're always up against how you're fixturing the design and you want to be careful not to over fixture the design. Will SolidWorks Friday, will Friday be the same time slot? Yeah, 1 p.m. Uh, Barry says, welcome back to the internet, Toby. Missed your TTTs. I am uh, hosting again a little bit on some other channels. So if you if you check out, uh, if you just search for me, you'll find that I'm, I'm still putting up content. Uh, so if you just search for Toby Schnars, you'll find maybe some of my other channels. And of course, those of you who haven't seen my content uh, on other channels, you can go back and you can look through what Barry's talking about there. Uh, he's talking about uh, Toby's Tech Talk, uh, real, real fun uh, web series that I did for a long time. And I'm trying to resurrect it a little bit on a new channel so if you want to check that out if you want to get some some nighttime SolidWorks activity in uh, you can check that out uh, I appreciate the compliment though Barry uh, my pleasure yep my pleasure uh, Sun Sundaram uh, my pleasure to be hosting all right awesome We'll use your tips and tricks in Model Mania models. All right, good, Ramos. Yeah, I did win Model Mania uh, way back in 2003, and I used a lot of these tips back then too. So uh, hopefully, you know, that that's uh, insightful, inspiring, and, and hopefully you will be able to use them in Model Mania this year. If you want to do any other, uh, you know, modeling type of contest, just look me up and we'll maybe we can spin something up together. Can we make the handle... Can we make the handle by revolution? Not really. You wouldn't really be able to do a revolve because the path of the handle is so um, non-uniform. It's it's following a spline path and it's getting wider and more narrow in different regions. So revolve wouldn't really work for that. Um, you can you could do it probably in several revolves, but you'd still have to somehow blend them together. Show some surface model. Okay, we got a, Brian. We got a request for surface modeling in the future. Let's make sure we get that in from. Uh, yeah, and of course, any suggestions you have for future events, be sure to drop them into the. Um, be sure to drop them into the um, comments down below as well. <laughs> How to be an international expert, a Abraham? Yeah, well, that's a good one. I like that. How to be an international expert in SolidWorks? I like that. It's like a spy. Some information about the flexible monitor mount. Yeah, it's uh, uh, Brian's going to be doing that one on Friday. It's going to be some a little bit of assembly, a little bit of part modeling, um, some more tips and tricks. Got anything my ninth grade engineers could work well with, could do well with? Yeah, I mean, they could definitely do well with uh, this episode. Now I have many hours to sift through. Uh, so Tam Tamborora Station uh, likes my uh, likes this style. Yeah, if you like this style, just check me out. Just do a Google search. Um, I got new stuff that goes up. I actually uh, I have new stuff that goes up pretty regularly. So um, you know, trying to especially right now, just really trying to help all the users out there who are uh, trying to brush up on their skills. So if you like it, if you like my style, you know, feel free to look me up in other mediums or hit me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm happy to help you out any way that I can. You know, especially right now, I think everybody's kind of in the same spot where uh, things are a little bit weird. And, and if we can just reach out to somebody and ask for help and, and, you know, make our day a little bit easier, you know, I want to be that person. I want to help you out any way that I can. Okay, awesome. All right. Uh, and Shun says, nice, uh, uh, would, would like to see a SolidWorks touch tutorial. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that in the chat. Uh, also, make sure you put it in the comments below, um, especially if you're watching this in the recording. All right, I think we got through most of the questions. Uh, looks like April 6th is going to be a surface modeling one on SolidWorks Live. Thank you for that, Andrew Barnes. Really appreciate it. Uh, so uh, if you are looking for a surfacing tutorial, be sure to tune back in on April 6th. Looks like we're going to have some great content then too. 
All right. Awesome. I think we got through most of these. Uh, again, I want to just say thank you all so much. Uh, really enjoyed having everybody in here today. And we'll definitely look forward to seeing you at a future event. Uh, and I, I'm glad that you like this. Um, last name is Schnars. Got it up here. Question came in from chat. There you go. All right. So thank you all so much. Uh, looking forward to seeing you guys again next time. Bye-bye.